Greetings and welcome to the Animal Wellness Podcast, the official podcast of Animal Wellness Action. Hi, I'm your host, Joseph Grove. On this show, we talk about animals from the perspective of people who care about them and have the ability to improve their lives by influencing culture and supporting laws and regulations accordingly. To stay up to date with all of our news and information, subscribe to this podcast, receive our free newsletters and more, visit animalwellnessaction.org. Wayne Paselli and Marty Irby are my normal cohorts. Wayne is off doing Wayne things, so we have the pleasure of just being with Marty today. Uh, He is the executive director and chief lobbyist for this organization based in Washington, D.C., and um, I'm super excited about our, our guest today. We had him on, gosh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. Monty, it's been a while, but he is Marvin Earl, a.k.a. Monty Roberts. Monty, I live in Shelby County, Kentucky. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it being the horse uh, person that you are. Everyone I mention your name to, they know you. And it's like, oh, Monty Roberts, really? I've, many of my friends own horses, so you, you certainly come well known to people who love horses. And of course, that's what we're going to be talking about today, taking advantage of your expertise on that. Uh, You promote your natural horsemanship through your Join Up International organization, named after the core concept of your training program. Uh, Monty believes that horses use a nonverbal language, he calls it equus, uh, and that humans can use this language to communicate with horses. To promulgate his methods, Roberts has authored a number of books, including his original bestseller, The Man Who Listens to Horses, which has sold more than 6 million copies. He regularly tours with live uh, with a live demonstration, and he runs an equestrian academy in Solvang, California, and an online university to promote his ideas. Am I pronouncing that right? Is it Solvang or Solving? How do you pronounce that place? Solvang. Solvang, California. Okay, great. And, um, you know, uh, to starstruck people like me, uh, one thing that's very interesting is your, your background with uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, experienced horse people, including the Queen, have called Monty Roberts' method incredible and enlisted his training talents. Two-time world's greatest horseman winner, Ron Rawls, uses his training methods as the foundation of his work as well. So Monty, having worked with the queen, I bet you've been watching with great interest, all of the um, celebrations of the length of her reign. What have you taken away from what you've watched on TV and heard on the radio? You know, if it wasn't for Queen Elizabeth, my concepts would have been in a very small circle and uh, she took them global. And I've been to 41 countries for her and literally millions of people Uh, see my work, and a lot of them have changed. I think we have reached critical mass. I think about 20% of the people in the world now recognize that nonviolent training is acceptable, and it is preferable, in fact, uh, to those methods we call breaking or traditional methods, where violence is part of the act. And the traditional people, while I don't hate them, they simply say the horse has to know who's boss. And I suppose you could say that same thing about marriages if you wanted to have trouble. But, uh, you know, there is no boss. To cause the horse to want to is the idea. And uh, Ron Rawls came to me at 38 years of age with a Western saddle that had a cantle up in the middle of his shoulders. And uh, he was a backwoods cowboy. Sure enough, tough guy, Ron Rawls, but it didn't take him long. I had him here about six years or so. And what a difference he made uh, in his working with horses or his relationship to horses. Unbelievable change. And yes, uh, World's Greatest Horseman thing, I think, twice. And his son, Philip Rawls, was born and raised here on this property. And uh, he's in the top four or five in the world. And Zane Davis up in Montana is along in that same category. So the Western thing has changed. But do you know, could you answer me if I, if I ask you, what um, discipline has changed the most based on my concepts. Gosh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that at all. I'm going to put Marty on the hot seat. Well, I suspect it might be polo. Exactly, Marty. You but win. I think I knew that already. So. Okay. 
<laughs> it's polo. It's unbelievable. Adolfo Cambiasso sent 20 horses here, put them in my pastures, brought his breakers here, and they went, oh my God, what have we been doing? Because before my concepts went into practice with them, they were killing 52% of the horses that they broke by traditional methods. And it didn't matter that much to them at the time because they had a lot of grass and a lot of acres and uh, cheap horses, barb, little barb horses. But Adolfo Cambiasso said, you know, I want to breed upward and get them faster and bigger and stronger uh, for polo. And I want to get some money in them. I, I need to get good stallions and good seamen and good mares. And uh, so he came and he saw this. And that was the answer. And now his horses, I mean, he's doing a lot of embryo transfers now. And not one single horse has died in the breaking process for about eight years since they put my concepts to work. 52%? That's 52% 50, of the horses in South America, along with the polo people, 52% uh, of the horses in the breaking process either die or put down with broken limbs or wow. things like that. That's a, that's a scientific study. So um, it could change, and there's no value in killing horses, that's for sure. So if you just stop the killing, it would be good. But in addition to that, Adolfo Cambiasso has been the leading polo player of the world, and now his son is coming along, and he will be – the leading polo planer, player of the world. So they're on better horses and they're doing a better job. Simple as that. And uh, without killing them, uh, they're, they're way ahead of the game. Well, speaking of using nonviolent means to motivate horses, Marty, before we got on the air, you were talking about changes and proposed changes relative to whipping of horses uh, in the thoroughbred racing context. What is going on with that? And then and then I want to turn it over to Monty to get his perspective on whipping. Yes, well, last year, uh, some time ago, the New Jersey Racing Commission actually banned the use of the whip, striking the horse with the whip. And um, a lot of the jockeys there that were at the tracks in New Jersey were all up in arms about it. Several of them left and said they were going to California, that there were less stringent rules out there. Ultimately, what occurred is the New Jersey Racing Commission just some weeks ago has reversed that ban now. Um, in part, it was because of the jockeys leaving and them being so upset, but it was also in part because the new Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority that was created by the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act that we worked to pass and that Monty worked and helped us with. And so many, many people in the racing industry, like the Jockey Club and Arthur and Stacey Hancock helped with, has finalized some of their new rules. And the ones that are finalized include those related to the whip. I believe they will allow six strikes in a row um, based on uh, the last read that I took of them. And that is going to be uniform across the nation at every track in thoroughbred horse racing. Monty, are you, are you still um, uh, opposed to whipping of uh, the horses? Yeah, basically, basically I am opposed to whipping horses in racing. However, in, since I spoke with you last, I've been doing a lot of tests here and um, I, I've had a wonderful time with horses of Phil D'Amato and he's the leading trainer in Santa Anita right now. And um, he has quite a few horses with me. And he has some nice horses that have a lot of energy. And some of them, you know, wanted to rear up a bit. And some of them want, didn't want to go forward, but wanted to jump sideways and stuff. And I've been fooling around. And I, I think there's more to it than that. You know, Marty, in the gated horse industry, um, they use those tiny little whips with a very hard braided uh, plastic or nylon cover, almost like a wire really. And those are the worst. They're cutting little buggers, you know, and they just uh, do nothing but aggravate a horse and cause the horse to go into that pain. It's, it's strictly pain 
those little whips. And um, now the big whips, if you make them hard, they will also be painful. But taking a fairly big diameter in the whip, and you can make it as long as you want, uh, reasonably speaking for the horse's uh, sake in racing, you don't want it more than a couple of feet long. But the diameter of that whip should be large and the surface should be soft. And when you strike the horse with a soft surface, and particularly a soft uh, uh, end to the whip, the, the flap on the end of the whip, and that is made of soft material, my word, how it will help a horse go forward instead of resisting and acting against a whip. So I say it's more the how the whip is made than it is whether there's whips or no whips. And um, there's a lot of jockeys that feel they need a whip for safety's sake. I think it's a bit off the mark. But uh, I think Norway is proving that. They banned the whips in Norway. And um, the jockeys got very upset about it, but they didn't leave and go to California. They stayed there, but they started leaving the whips in the jocks room. They said they could only use the whip if it was in actual fact that a wreck was about to happen and they thought the whip could, could uh, choose, uh, could fix it, otherwise they would be disqualified if they used the whip. Well, they don't even have any whips now, they just left them in the room. And maybe that's the best way. But you know, I have a rope whip, not that I'm promoting this because it's soft yarn, cotton yarn, and I call it the giddy up rope. And it's very large, it's an inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter. And on the end, it has a fuzzy, it's braided cotton yarn. So if you think about that, it's just a floppy thing. And actually the horses are running from that as you use it across, they don't even allow it on the track because they say it'll bother other horses flipping and flacking around. And maybe it will. And I'm not saying that I'm promoting that to be used in racing. But what I am saying is soften the surface. If you're gonna use a whip at all, get a diameter on it and soften the surface and your horses will respond safer and more actively than they will when you use pain. Monty, are there some whips that have tied up in the ends foreign objects, such, uh, you know, any kind of something to make the whip more painful. I, I believe I've heard that sometimes there are not maybe small rocks, but other objects braided into the end of the whip to make it more painful and therefore ostensibly more effective. Is, is that a thing? You know, I rode races in 1946. I was 10, 11 years old, riding races with Tucker Slender, who later became the leading uh, the head of the uh, starting gate at Santa Anita for about 20 years, and his son is now Jay Slender. We rode races together, and there were there were sticks that these guys, these owners, would give me to ride a horse with in 46, 47, 48 that had little like BBs clamped onto. You could take the weight, a fishing weight that has a split in the lead uh, BB that you're using for a fishing weight, and you would clamp it into the fuzz at the, the, the popper at the end of the whip because it hurt the hell out of the horse when you hit him. What did I know? They hand me the whip, I used the whip that they handed me. But as I watched the reaction of the horses, it became obvious to me this was the wrong decision. Stinging pain is not the answer. Um, you can hustle them away with some things that they see more than feel, and they will run faster. But if there's no whips at all, it's as fair for one as it is for another. And uh, actually, that's all we ought to be really thinking about is to keep racing fair. 
and uh, same day medication is not fair. We know that. And uh, there are substances that they will keep making that you have to retest for because we don't have the tests for them. And that makes total sense, Monty. I think one of the things I failed to mention in the new regulations is that it is, I believe, a foam whip with a foam uh, ending, which is soft, just as you're saying, that the new HISA or Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority will allow. I would vote for that in a minute. Um, And then um, maybe you placate the jockeys that feel they have to have something for safety. I don't want to go to any funeral of a jockey that was killed thinking he was unsafe because of the rules that we made. And I want them to feel safe. But at the same time, I don't want to go to the funeral of a horse that got killed because he dived into the rail after being struck with something that was very painful. All right. Very good. And and I want to move now to another timely uh, question, one I think you might have some insight on, um, and it relates to your work with children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds and you're bringing them around horses to improve their I'm going to I'm going to say roughly their psychological welfare. We have done some reporting on animalwellnessaction.org and recently did a podcast about this topic about how many mass shooters seem to have demonstrated hostility and abuse uh, relative to animals before they rose to the level of hurting humans. Uh, what in your experience supports the theory that animal abuse is a predictor of human violence? Well, it's a pretty simple thing. I have two doctorates in behavioral sciences, so I should know the answer to this one if anybody does. I just did an interview with a student of mine who was arrested 10 or 12 times while he was growing up and who had several concussions with gang fights and um, who has a hearing disablement that he has to have things in his head. And he just went through all of my courses and you just wouldn't meet a nicer young man than this. He has really come around with the use of animals to get him right. Um, Back to the fact that we are predators. And if we can control an animal, then we feel we can control another human being. We just have that in our DNA. And as children, we will begin to explore that if we're uh, inclined to. And uh, he had a younger brother that beat up on him as he was growing up with a hearing disorder. And uh, he went wild with anger. And so did the brother and the brother still is that way. I use horses for problems of this sort with humans all the time. Post-traumatic stress is not a disorder. It is not PTSD. Post-traumatic stress coming back from war is an injury. You went there relatively normal. You came back abnormal. That's an injury. And injuries heal. Disorders tend not to heal. There's something you're born with, a disorder. So I get people thinking about being fair with other human beings and using uh, the work that we do with horses to show them that being fair with other horses and people is a great therapeutic adventure, and they can get their pride back, they can get their trust back, and they can even trust themselves. When they come home from war, their tendency is not to trust a wife, not to trust children, and not to trust the government of your country. And um, you have to get your trust back, and you have to act as a person that wants to be trusted. So they go in the round pen or go in an enclosure with a horse and do what I call join up. And the horse chooses to come with them when they get their body right. And you ought to see them smile and realize that they can be a human being uh, that is well adjusted as well as one that is angry and fighting everybody. 
And um, I'd encourage our listeners at this point, if they want to read about this particular issue, the escalation of animal violence to human violence, uh, Wayne Paselli, our founder, um, has a terrific blog on animalwellnessaction.org called The Reddest of Red Flags. Uh, we're working very hard right now to get past the ACE Act, the Animal Cruelty Enforcement Act, and um, you can learn more about it there. So thank you for answering that question. Uh, we're in the middle of Triple Crown season. We have one race left this weekend. I'm very curious to get your observations on uh, the first two races and and how you believe the they've gone and what you foresee for this this coming final race this weekend. Certainly, I enjoyed the Kentucky Derby, and um, just let me say that when that race was over and an eighty to one. An unexpected winner was the outcome. I was just glued to the set, man, and wondering what was going on. And then when the outrider went to the horse and the horse attacked his riding horse, his pony, you might call it, then I was glued to the thing all over again, and they left it on long enough for me to see that he not only was attacking the horse, he accidentally, in my opinion, attacked the leg of the rider too. And the rider was <laughs> frightened and took evasive action and was criticized greatly for it. And I have to tell you that anyone that would criticize that man for what he did has never been in that position. They have never been attacked by a half a ton of horse flesh that wanted to kill him. And he did what he thought he had to do at that moment, and nobody should criticize him at all. I believe I could fix that horse in five to six days because that horse, what probably did this before the 30,000 claim they put him in for a few weeks before the derby. You think about it. Why did they put him in a 30,000 claiming if he could run the way he could run? And don't call them stupid for that. They probably got attacked. And when that horse went to the track, he went there with every intention of winning. That's a good thing. But he's a horse. And so if he was running in the wild 100,000 years ago, he would be the leading stallion of that group, you can bet on it because he will eat their neck off if he chooses to. And that's, that's not bad for racing. You have to give him something uh, to chew on. And I, I know I've been attacked by several stallions in my time. And I know that it's the scariest thing you could ever imagine. I was pulled off of a gelding by a stallion one time on this property where I am now. I was already in my 40s and I was shaken like a, a dog would shake a sock um, by this stallion. I'm sure he thought he had the gelding in his mouth. I have to go with that. He dropped me from about five feet in the air and I, I still have a scar tissue, massive scar tissue on my left side from where he did that. Um, he wasn't a bad horse. He was in competition and he was going to win. And that's what the horses feel as a flight animal. They have to do, particularly with two testicles and a lot of testosterone flowing. They have to take charge. They're out there to beat those other horses. They don't know that there's a race. They don't know that there's millions of dollars up. They don't even know that there's a finish line. They just simply know I'm going to lead this field. And he did right. that. Right. Um, how did the I handicappers, I, how did the handicappers get that wrong like that? Right. How did they misjudge this horse this way? Well, the fact that he only ran for a claiming price before the Kentucky Derby. And so he won the race. Um, that doesn't make him a Kentucky Derby winner. And he came up from the lowest ranks you could imagine. And they entered him in the Kentucky Derby. And then enough people scratched that he got to run. 
It, it's quite a story. A movie should be made of it someday because it's quite a story. Uh, the handicappers then said, they just brought up some claiming horse. He can't possibly win the Kentucky Derby. So they bet a dollar on him and he was 80 to one. Um, it's just amazing. And now when he comes back in the Belmont, he will probably be, I would say, in the five to seven to one category uh, as he comes to the Belmont. Now, if I see him attack the pony horse at the end of the race in the Belmont, I am going to find out who those people are and call them because I can fix him. I have fixed several stallions of the same nature. And you give them something to attack, and you give them something that they have won. They win. They won the race, but what the hell? They didn't know it was a race. They're just running. But when you give them a win after the race for those horses that would attack in that way, uh, then they're, they're perfectly happy with that. And they might, they might give the audience quite a show of what I would do to cause this to be safe for humans, but I could cause it to be absolutely safe for humans and, um, and let the horse consider himself a winner. Uh, they, they're not flight animals, they're flight animals. And he flew, he flew and he did that thing. And then he said, now I am the boss and I'll control you. And here they come with this pony and grab hold of him. And he says, get this thing out of my way. I am the boss here. Um, it, it's easy to, if you study the actions of positive signal taxes, it's easy to figure out why he's doing this. That's going into pressure instead of going away from pressure. And that's what horses do. Did you know that we were thigmotaxic in one part of our body? I was just saying that to myself the other day. What do you I'm think? Kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't even know that. Yeah, we go into pain in one part of our body. Do you know what it is? No. Our mouth. Think of a baby bringing in teeth with red gums and pain like you can't believe with the teeth coming in. What do they want to do? Yeah. I, they, but, you. they want to bite and chew. Yeah. Teeth. They want to bite down on a hard rubber ring. That's positive pigmotaxis. And that's the only place in our body that we have it. Um, the horse has it all over his body and particularly in his flanks. And you come up to him with a pony horse and you reach out and grab his mouth and pull him back and your foot's in his flank. He attacks the horse. It, it's into pressure. And the reason that horses came up that way 50 million years ago, the dogs started to eat them. And the first point of attack was the flank. So they could tear the skin and the intestines would come out and the whole pack of dogs could eat. But the horse that went into the dog and kicked him in the head, got him to open his mouth and then they run away. The horse that blasts away the instant he feels pain there, he gets the skin ripped and he feeds the dogs. So that's why horses are into pressure animals. And if they hit their hip on a narrow door going into the stall, the next time they hit it harder and faster. And pretty soon you can't even get them to go through a narrow door. It happens all over the world and people will beat them for it when they don't realize what, what's going on. But it's called positive thigmotaxis or negative thigmotaxis, which we are all over our body. We'll jump away from pain on every place else in our body, but not our mouth. And where did the dentists live when we lived in the caves? There was no dentist when we lived in the caves. So the ones that didn't eat because of the pain in the mouth, they died. And the ones got to mate and have children that did go into pressure in the mouth. Fascinating. Well, yeah. I, I love this kind of conversation, Marty. Yeah, Joseph, I, I just wanted to comment on that, Monty. I am really glad to hear you explain things that way because, you know, having been around horses my whole life, um, when we saw the horse win the derby, it was, of course, an exciting moment. Uh, the underdog, especially in a year where we don't have the horses running with Lasix, 
which was a huge, huge thing they started at the Derby last year. Um, and we praised publicly the owners in the press um, for winning and for winning with the underdog and then for making the decision to actually not run the horse in the second leg of the Triple Crown in the Preakness. And man, I cannot tell you how many people on social media in different places attacked me and wanted to know why I didn't say anything about the incident that occurred with what you described. And I didn't say anything because I said, well, if you know anything about horses, you would understand why that happened, just, just like you said. So I'm so glad to hear you explain that because I think nine point, probably nine out of 10 or, or 99 out of 100 people would never, ever even think of that or have any inkling that that is the case. So it's very important to explain. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I, as a child, I'm looking back on it, and I think I was about, I was about six or seven years old, and I was dealing with a horse called Paycheck that was a registered quarter horse stallion. And my father had me lunging him on a single line with a lunge whip. And he kept putting his ears back and kind of taking a dive at me. And my father screaming at me, hit him, hit him harder with that whip. And I was just a child. And, and, and I, I struck him across the shoulder with that stinging lunge whip. And he came at me and took me into the ground. And my father had to jump over the fence and pull him off of me. And uh, he, I mean, he damn near killed me. And I don't know if I had broken bones from that. I had 72 prepubescent fractures. So you can go from there. But I was also attacked by a horse called Lucky Blanton. And both of them were registered quarter horses, the first, the first registered quarter horses stallions on earth. And um, he attacked me on another horse and got up on my horse to attack me personally. And uh, so I've lived with that, that business. And uh, I took on horses here that were very well-bred thoroughbred horses that were attacking people and uh, managed to set up operations where they could not do their attack and didn't want to do their attack. And uh, it, it worked out really well. But honest to God, a good education in behavioral sciences uh, really gives you another look at what we're doing with horses. And it's kind of what put me out of the racing industry in retirement. I'm 87 years old now. So, but I, uh, uh, in 25 years with the German operation called Gestut Fairhoff, I had 52 champions, year in high weight champions in 25 years two a year. Um, so I got something right. And uh, I, I'm proud of that. But I'm, I'm no baffer in, in producing racehorses and going to the track and being a trainer at the track. And I appreciate good trainers at the track. And I worked with some of the best. But understanding the behavior of a horse, knowing them as if they were your brother, um, is so wonderful. And I, I, wanna, I wanna do one last book where I really get in heavily to the behavioral patterns that um, got me these doctorates and, and allowed me to study in such a way that I could understand more the behavior of horses. You mentioned Bob Baffert and we've covered a lot of what Bob Baffert has been up to. Let me ask you this, Monty. Uh, did Bob Baffert get his just desserts or was he given a raw deal? Well, I certainly wouldn't say that he was given a raw deal. When you, when you look at a man that's been a registered uh, trainer uh, for many, many years, several decades, and that he has 30 some bad tests that came back, and I think it was 30 some before there was any action against him at all. You couldn't really call it a bad deal under any stretch of the imagination. But I don't think Bob Baffert is a horrible human being that ought to be strung up by his heels. We, we should understand him just the same as we understand horses. And he was allowed to win races because he had 
I think, very good scientific veterinarians that mix things up so they couldn't be tested and things like that. And I don't think that he entered the world of being a racehorse trainer with the greatest integrity ever, that's for sure. But call it our fault or call it the industry's fault for letting it go as far as it did and not heading him off long before they did. Um, where we now know that tests came back uh, positive and nothing was done at all to uh, the future of his training or the past of his training. So I don't want to blame Baffert all that much. He did what we allowed him to do. And now I don't know. I don't think he's getting a bad deal. I think he's had enough good deals uh, to fill a boxcar. Yep. Marty, uh, you, you have written probably more than anyone for us on this issue. Uh, as we approach the last race of the Triple Crown, what are you looking for this coming weekend? Well, I think uh, most importantly, and I am proud of our work in this area, that we helped prevent Bob Baffert from running in any of the Triple Crown races this year as a result of that test from the horse that crossed the finish line first at last year's Kentucky Derby. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what Rich Strike does on the Belmont. That's the longest of the three tracks in the Triple Crown races. And most people don't know this, but it's the 154th Belmont Stakes. The Belmont is actually seven or eight years older than the Derby itself. And uh, maybe a year or so, um, the, the Prinkness, I think, uh, is the last that was developed because it was the 140. Uh, eighth Derby, 147th Preakness, and there's 154th Belmont Stakes. Um, we won't see a huge, huge crowd because they're probably, uh, you know, most years when there's not going to be a Triple Crown winner that won the first two races, the crowd is always a little thinner. But I think this horse is going to bring in more than usual because he's the underdog. Everybody always wants the underdog to win. The people are out there cheering him on, and it is a bit of a Cinderella story. And I believe that if Bob Baffert had been running horses, we might not have seen that horse win the Kentucky Derby. So uh, it's a historic time in horse racing to see these things occur. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, Monte, what's um, what's up on your your radar? What uh, are you on tour? Any are you are you taking your show on the road these days? What what's up next in your world? You know, I have a medical condition called CIDP, and it it ran a dead heat with COVID. And uh, so I'm two and a half years now uh, in a different world completely. And I don't know that I'll ever be able to tour again. Uh, maybe though I can do some one of kind of uh, uh, demonstrations of my concepts where things look to be interesting to people in England or United States or Germany where I've been most active. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to say about the Kentucky Derby that I, I think the byword of this last Kentucky Derby was, who is that? And you thought, where is it going? And that horse was running faster in the last 16th of a mile than any of the other horses in the field by far, wasn't he? And he just closed and ran off with it. And it isn't that much further in the Belmont. So is he going to lay in the middle and then run that way at the end of it? If he is, he's going to be prominent in, in that race. And uh, I'll be very interested. They'll probably keep the cameras off of him at the time that he's caught by the pony horse uh, after the race. But I assume that same fellow will be, be there. I, I'm not sure but I, I have great uh, admiration for that man. He did what he had to do at the moment. And uh, I hear that he's very good and will probably learn from that last one some things to do. There are some things that I learned about mean stallions that I could, I could certainly help those people if, if you all would be uh, instrumental in, in letting the owners and trainers know that I'm out here and, and – uh, that I, I have some ideas that would, would help that if it does continue to be a problem. All right. Well, thank you for, for that. Monty, what is a good website 
if people want to learn more about you and get some of your material, where would you send them online to do that? Yeah, well, it's MontyRoberts.com. And then there's all, I don't know anything about computers, but it's all these branches. You know, I have an online university, um, which has 700 and some lessons on it. And uh, then there, there's all sorts of uh, branches of my website. But the word Monty Roberts or the name Monty Roberts is, uh, generally speaking, uh, the way to get involved and then branch off and go to these other things and look to see what I've done. Um, I, I've had a, a career that's just been absolutely phenomenal, that is to say, lucky. I'm no, I'm no celebrity. I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I've done anything except uh, to work for the betterment of horses. And in um, 1988, Her Majesty saw two magazine articles that said the same thing. Uh, they came here on, in an open house that Farrell W. Jones, he's a trainer of, uh, in, in the standing of uh, uh, the thing that they put those the best in, what does he call it, the uh, uh, Hall of Fame. He's a Hall of Fame trainer, Charles Whittingham and Farrell W. Jones, both Hall of Fame trainers. They had open houses at my place. And the, they brought people on buses, trainers from the track. And I had 180 young horses in training that year, 88, 87, 87 and 88, they did it. 180 horses in training. And after I did these public demonstrations, I had 20. They said, there's a trick, there's something wrong here, that'd never work, I, what'll happen to us if this kind of stuff gets away? Um, we'll be considered awful and they, they just buried me. And that's when the queen called and uh, she said, these two magazines, one was from Florida and one was from California. And she said, I know that they're 3000 miles apart. And these two wrote the same thing. So I, she sent a man here, Sir John Miller. He watched me work. And uh, the Queen has taken over from there and sent me to the world. And it's just been fantastic. And meeting Marty Irby. I mean, Marty Irby is such an example of being on one side of this issue for the growing up years of his life. And there was nothing I showed in the Tennessee Walking Horse Division. I know what they did. And I didn't happen to like it at the time, but I showed. And I won a world championship in a thing called Horse Mastership of the American Horse Shows Association. And all of that was going on in Shelbyville and all around there in Kentucky. Um, I didn't like it, but they did it, and everybody said it was okay. Marty Irby said, wait a minute. When he took us down there, and his boss said, if it's good enough for Queen Elizabeth, it's good enough for us. I want to see what's going on. And they brought me some babies, and I started these babies for them in Shelbyville. And Marty Irby said, hang on. I am leaving this industry, uh, at least the way it is. And I know it's been tough for his family who was in the big lick uh, industry, Tennessee walking horses. And his former wife was the same uh, in, the, in the family of uh, the big lick. And Marty Irby is one of the bravest and the most um, wonderful people to, to dive off and say, hang on, we've been wrong. We're going to do it another way. And I, I just couldn't consider him to be a better friend than he is to the horses and to me too. And, and I would pile onto that, but since he's my boss now, I, I'm worried he wouldn't take me as, as sincere, but, but Monty, I see him exactly uh, the same way, and I am so glad your message of nonviolence, your work with young people, uh, with horses, your whole approach, um, I, I think it would be just as fair to say of you that you have made 
the world a better place. So it's been a pleasure twice now to have you on the show. So I'm so grateful uh, for that. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, And Marty, before we go, um, I do like every episode to get a quick rundown of what Animal Wellness Action is doing on the Hill. Where are we with our legislative efforts? Well, well, let me add something else first before we jump to that. I know we've gone a little long, but first, Monty, you know, I appreciate you so much. And I would have never done the things I've done it and not learned from you the right way to do it and seen that in Shelbyville, Tennessee. So, you know, it's really all because of you in the first place. But I, I greatly appreciate you and your friendship and the 17 years we've been friends. I had not until last year ever been out to flag is up, but I actually got to go last summer and spend a week and stayed with Monty and Pat in the house and really learned so much more. So we've been able to apply those techniques all across the world, tell people about them. And I'm still hoping that one day we get to go see Queen Elizabeth and have a marmalade sandwich with her. (laughs) Okay, I'll tell her. (laughs) So Joe, on our um, rundown, we have really focused in uh, this last six months of the 117th Congress that'll end in December. We have one bill, the FDA Modernization Act, that is before the House of Representatives tomorrow. Actually, on Tuesday, it's part of a larger package to reauthorize the FDA's user fees. And that legislation, very simply, as we've said before, uh, takes a 1938 statute that requires animal testing for any drug approved by the FDA and makes that optional so that we can use the best science today. And the best science may not be animal testing in many circumstances. We're also working hard to pass the Animal Cruelty Enforcement Act that would help us better enforce laws that are already on the books, just like the Horse Protection Act of 1970. Monty and I have worked on for the past 17 years and and Monty longer than that. And we also are working, of course, to still pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act. Our friends uh, Howard and Carol Baskin have dedicated most of their life to, and that's looking really good right now. And last but not least, I think uh, a bill that has a good chance at getting done in this Congress is the Bear Protection Act. It was uh, a bill that passed the U.S. Senate twice by unanimous consent 20 years ago and never passed the House. And your U.S. Senator, Mitch McConnell, was the leader of the bill back then. Uh, It deals with the trade in bear gallbladders that the Chinese government has been promoting Uh, because they have been promoting the bile from bear gallbladders as a treatment for COVID-19 with no scientific basis. Um, We're trying to stop that, but um, it's looking good. I think we're going to get two or three done. Uh, FDA is the one that is most likely, and um, we have the Senate bill on that side, uh, led by your other senator, Senator Rand Paul, um, coming up for a vote in that chamber as well. So looking, looking to be a good Congress. Uh, Not much in the way of horses, but uh, we still continue to press for the PAST Act and changes to the PAST Act and other legislation to help the horses we all care so deeply about as well. All right. Well, thank you, Marty. Thank you again, Mr. Roberts. Much appreciated. And we want to always thank our listeners for listening to the Animal Wellness Podcast. Be sure to visit animalwellnessaction.org for all of our news and information and to sign up for our news alerts. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, and we invite you to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, or Spotify. I'm your host, Joseph Grove, and we'll be back soon with another episode of the Animal Wellness Podcast.